our salvation, as we're going to see when we're born again and saved and made new, we receive the Holy Spirit. But there's something about when God's people come together in one accord, that is one mind, and consistently pray together, seeking the Lord and humbling ourselves before Him. And so as we enter into this time where some Christians might call it Lent, which starts on Ash Wednesday, which is this Wednesday, uh, you know, we don't traditionally celebrate that, but I believe it's appropriate that we spend time as a church, and I'm calling us as your pastor to spend time together in one accord, to come together and join together with one mind and seek the Lord and pray that he do a work in our hearts and in this church for his glory. And so we're going to enter into a 40 days of prayer for our church. And in order to do that, we've given you this nice prayer guide. And in here, you'll find a prayer prompt and a scripture to just guide you as you go before the Father in prayer each day. You'll find that Sunday, they, you, don't, you don't have a prayer prompt on Sundays because you do that here with the body. Uh, we come together on the Lord's Day. We don't forsake the assembling together of ourselves. We come together because God wants us to, and we're going to pray together. But throughout the week, I encourage you to allow this guide to help you pray about different things in relationship to your life and the life of this church. I'm just going to say this. I sense that God is already moving in this body. And I'm not saying that just to be weird or whatever, sentimental. I know he is because I'm seeing God move in hearts. And I'm hearing people say that God has moved in their heart in a particular way. But I believe that God will do more as we humble ourselves before him and seek him in prayer. And so the spirit behind this is, let's just seek God. Let's humble ourselves, repent of our sin, look to him, and trust in him for what he wants to do in and through the life of this congregation. Amen? So this will be available as you leave today. Um, there'll be some people out in the back to help make sure you get those. But make sure you take that. We'll try to send a reminder via one call on Wednesday to start uh, so you, in case you forget. But let's join together constantly in prayer, and let's start right now. We're not going to wait till Wednesday. Father God, we're grateful that we can come here as your people. Lord, that you've done a great work in our hearts. We're grateful for that. Uh, Lord, and we pray today that as we come before you as your people, that you would do a great work in us. Uh, Lord, we know that the cleansing and the judgment starts in the house of God first. And so, God, we pray that by your word that you would pierce our heart, cut our heart, reveal to us, God, our sin, and bring us to that place of confession, of humility, of reliance upon you and your grace and your power to live before you. I pray that for this body, God, that that be so. And as we come here today, we recognize, God, that there are people that are carrying with them burdens. And Jesus says to cast your cares upon him. And so I invite you now just to do that. Whatever burden you might have here this morning, cast it before Jesus. Jesus taught us to pray and ask for our daily bread. In a room this size, there's many needs represented, but God knows them all. And he desires for you to come and bring them before him. And do that right now. Bring your need, your physical, spiritual, whatever it might be, need before him. We know that our greatest need is for forgiveness of sin. And the scripture promises us and assures us that if we confess our sin to God in Jesus' name, that he is faithful and just to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Bring those sins, those 
thoughts, those actions, those behaviors, those things that you knew you should have done and you didn't do, bring them all before the throne of grace this morning. Lord God, we're grateful that you hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, who opens the way to come to you. And we pray, God, that as your people, that you would protect us from the enemy of our soul. We know that there is one who is seeking to devour. And so, God, would you give us protection? Would you give us the way out when temptation comes our way? May we be found walking in the way that you've called us to. Help us to do this all by your grace. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. You know, God's grace is amazing toward us in Christ. There's a great song that the church has been singing for years. It's called Amazing Grace. Uh, There's a little bit of a rendition that's been added, but still it's the same good song. Speaking of the true, amazing grace of God. We don't deserve it. We didn't deserve it. But God in his grace, in his mercy, gave us the best gift of all, Jesus Christ, his only son. Let's stand and sing to the glory of God. Amazing grace.
All right, well, last week at the end of chapter 2, we saw that Jerusalem was, uh, yeah, Jesus was in Jerusalem. Jerusalem wasn't in Jerusalem, but uh, obviously, but Jesus was in Jerusalem, and he was there for the Passover festival. And we know that um, he not only cleansed the temple while he was there for the first time, but he also did what? He did many other signs or miracles while he was there. And John tells us that it was because of those signs or miracles that he performed that many came to believe in his name. Yet, John also tells us in verse 24 and 25 of chapter 2, so just kind of look back there if you would, um, there from John 3, he said in verse 24, but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them, that is those who believed on account of the signs, because he knew all people. And needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. And we saw that many believed in Jesus, many expressed a faith in Jesus, but Jesus himself did not entrust himself, or literally believe himself, to them. And we saw that this was because he knew the condition of their heart. He he knew that their faith was not a genuine faith or trust in him. They were believing because of the signs or the wonders, the flashes and the booms, right? We'll call those people that. Um, But he knew their heart. God knows our heart. We know that. He knows the condition of our heart. He knows the motives of our heart. He knows us better than anyone, including he knows us better than we know ourselves. And we know that by John mentioning this, he again points to the reality of something, and that is that Jesus is, in fact, both truly man and truly God. Uh, We've seen that already in John chapter 1, where the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That is, God the Son entered into the creation that He made as a man. He was truly man and truly God. So Jesus is the one true God. He is Yahweh in the flesh. And as, be, as God, as Jesus is God, he knows our heart, he knows our thoughts, he knows our motives, he knows where you and I stand in relation to him. He knows where we are. Um, he knows whether we are separated from him or united with him in faith. And we're going to see that as we turn here to John chapter 3. We're going to see that demonstrated in the life of Nicodemus, and then we're going to see that in the next chapter as we turn to the Samaritan woman. Jesus knows our heart. He knew Nicodemus' heart, and he knew the Samaritan woman's heart as well. And in this conversation that he has with Nicodemus, Jesus reveals to Nicodemus and to us what we are truly in need of. What what Nicodemus truly needed and what you and I truly need if we are to stand in right relationship with God. Let's look to John chapter 3, starting in verse 1. We're going to read to verse 8. Now, there was a man born of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, or most assuredly, depending on your translation, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, or most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And we're going to stop there because that's going to take us a while just to get through, Lord willing. Father, we pray that you would help us to understand your word today, that you would speak to us, O God, 
In Jesus' name, amen. So looking there at verse 1, we find something out about the man who came to Jesus by night. Nicodemus was a Pharisee and a ruler of the Jews. And so we know that Nicodemus was an educated and devout man of faith by just him saying that. Uh, Belonging to the Jewish sect of the Pharisees meant that he would have known the Scripture and the Mosaic Law very, very well. They were a very conservative group, and they tightly clung to the law of the Old Testament. So much so that they added numerous, and I mean numerous, man-made regulations and traditions in order to keep them from breaking the law. One of those is the Sabbath. They added a number of rules to the Sabbath command. And so he was a man of devout faith. He was a strict observer of the Old Testament law, at least he thought so. And he would have clung tightly to it. The problem was that the Pharisees put their traditions and their man-made regulations on equal par with the Scripture. So not only was the Scripture authoritative to tell them how to live and obey God, their man-made traditions and regulations were just as equally authoritative as the Bible. Is that a problem? Yes. Everyone should shake their head. Yeah, absolutely it is. It's not God's Word. It's man-made. That's the key here. But they would have been very well-versed in the Scripture, the Old Testament, and the Mosaic Law. Nicodemus was also a ruler of the Jews, meaning he was a part of the 70-member Sanhedrin Council. That was, if you will, a supreme court for Israel. It's their version of the supreme court. Uh, The high priest oversaw the Sanhedrin, and they met daily in Jerusalem, in the temple, to decide matters and to rule over things. Of course, they could not give the death penalty. That had to be kicked over to Rome. You'll find that later when Jesus is on trial. They couldn't sentence him to death. He had to go to Rome in order to be sentenced to death. But they would meet and they would decide things. They were in charge. And he was a member of that ruling council. Now we don't know much more really about Nicodemus other than a couple things. We see in John 7 that he, uh, in the midst of the Sanhedrin, spoke up when Jesus was being questioned and accused, and he said, let's not dismiss him or condemn him until he could speak for himself. They ignored him, but still, he spoke up in John chapter 7, and we'll see that as we get to it. In John chapter 19, we see that after Jesus died on the cross, Nicodemus came with Joseph of Arimathea, um, and he brought with him 75 pounds of spices for Jesus' body to anoint him for his burial. So we know by that that he was a very wealthy man if he could afford 75 pounds of spices. So he was intelligent, he was wealthy, he was religious. Ah, pretty good characteristics, right? All of us want to strive to be that. Maybe. All right, so um, here's one thing, though. While a lot of people speculate, there does seem to be a changing of tune with Nicodemus after this conversation. He does seem to be more on the side of Jesus as we go through John, but you and I will never be able to say whether he came to faith in Christ or not. The Bible doesn't say. So here's my suggestion for us, and here's what I would encourage us with. We'll just have to wait till we get there. That's all all we know. We cannot assume things that the Scripture does not tell us. But we do know that he became more favorable toward Jesus, so much so that he risked his own reputation and standing by attending to the burial. That's pretty significant, pretty significant. But we don't know if he came, became a Christian or not. Verse 2, this man came to Jesus, it says, by night. And so Nicodemus didn't come in the daytime, he came in the nighttime. Many have speculation as to what that means. Uh, perhaps he did so because he wanted to do in secret He didn't want to be caught or found out that he was coming to question this miracle worker and sign doer. But we don't know for sure whether that was his uh, motive or not. Uh, But what we do know is he came. He came and he questioned Jesus. And he asked him, or he said to him, Rabbi, so he called him a teacher. We know that you are a teacher from God. For no one can do these signs that you do 
unless God is with him. And so Nicodemus was right. He identified Jesus rightly as a teacher, and he identified Jesus rightly as someone come from God, and he identified rightly that only God could do the things that Jesus was doing, but he did not truly understand the identity of the one standing before him. And we also have to realize, according to 1 Thessalonians, that when the lawless one comes, or the Antichrist, or the false prophets and t-shirts come, Satan can also perform false signs and wonders. And so he was kind of partly correct. Satan can mimic and do powerful things. But only God could do the things that Jesus was doing. And he was right. But he just didn't get who was standing right in front of him. He didn't know the the true identity of Jesus. But the signs had him curious, didn't they? He was one of those people that John talks about in chapter 2. He was curious because of the signs and the miracles that Jesus was doing. And while Nicodemus was right, he didn't know who Jesus was, but Jesus knew who Nicodemus was. Jesus knew who Nicodemus was, even though Nicodemus didn't know who Jesus was. Are Are you trekking with me? All right. And we'll see this play out in in this dialogue that we're going to be going through here. Number one, Jesus knows our hearts. That's what we were just told in John chapter 2, and this is what we're now seeing. This is an example of a person whom Jesus knows the heart of, Nicodemus. And he came to Jesus, and Jesus tells him exactly what he needed to hear and what we need to hear as well. Verse 3. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, or most assuredly, I say to you. So whenever you hear Jesus say this, it's very important. Ears should perk up. It's not that they're more important than the other things that he says or the rest of God's word. But this is very important truth that he's about to speak. He says, unless one, unless a person is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So notice that Jesus dodges what Nicodemus says. He doesn't really respond to it, does he? He Oh, yes, I am a teacher. Oh, yes, I am from God. Oh, yes, God is with me. He doesn't identify, he doesn't even bring that up, does he? He goes straight to the point of what Nicodemus in his heart and in his life standing needed to hear. And he said, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, let's break this down a little bit. Born again. Uh, This really came to popularity after the election of Jimmy Carter. Uh, People using that phrase to identify themselves as a born-again Christian. Problem is, it's a redundant thing to say that you're a born-again Christian. You're not a Christian if you're not born again. Is that pretty clear? And Jesus just said. I mean, you'd be disagreeing with Jesus if you say, nah, that's not right. Jesus says otherwise. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You're not a child of God, a Christian, unless you're born again. So to say you're a born-again Christian, obviously we know in our culture what that means, but it's a redundant thing to say. It is very redundant to say, I'm born again and I'm a Christian. Well, yeah, a Christian means you've been born again. All right, so what does born again mean? Well, there's another way to uh, translate this. Uh, The Greek word can also be translated as born from above, so from the top down, uh, born from above, so born again or born from above. And in theological terms, we call it this, regeneration. Can you say that with me? Regeneration. Yeah, regeneration. And it means that we experience a new birth. It means that we're made new and that we're spiritually transformed what regeneration means. That means we are made new spiritually. We're brought from death to life spiritually. I like uh, theologian Wayne Grudem's definition. It kind of helps understand here um, a little bit maybe. Um, Regeneration or being born again is a secret act of God in which he imparts new spiritual life to us. We're going to see about the secret part in a moment when Jesus says it's a mystery. 
but it's a secret act of God, only God knows when this happens, in which he imparts to us a new spiritual life. We're brought from being dead in our sin to being made new in Christ. And so we'll, we'll define this a little bit more in a moment. But I want you to understand the significance of this. You have a Pharisee standing before Jesus, a Sanhedrin member standing before Jesus, and his passport is ready to go, and he's banking on the fact that he is a physical descendant of Abraham. He's banking on the fact that he's a good Pharisee. He's banking on the fact that he's a member of the Jewish ruling council, the Sanhedrin. And Jesus just shatters that idea entirely. He's banking on the fact that he's going to be in the kingdom of God, this long-awaited uh, kingdom that he's been waiting for. He's banking on the fact that he's going to be a child of God in heaven with God forever because of who he is and what he's done. And Jesus takes the hammer to that, doesn't he? Yes, he does. Because he says to this Pharisee and this Sanhedrin member, this descendant physically of Abraham, you won't see the kingdom of God. You won't become a child of God. You won't have eternal life with God forever if you're not born again. Stamp your passport as many times as you want. You're not getting anywhere. And before we pick on Nicodemus, I, I just want to say this. I think it's just the reality of many people today are like Nicodemus in the church. And I say that church in general. But maybe even here, we have a number of people here. Likely there is someone here today that is like Nicodemus in thinking that because of your Christian heritage, because of your religious upbringing, because of what you do for Jesus, your religious deeds or your works, because of your church attendance, because your name is on a membership roll somewhere, you're going to go to the kingdom of heaven and be with God forever. And Jesus smashes that idea entirely. He says, you will not see the kingdom of God. You will not be saved. You will not enter into God's presence as his child forever unless you have been born again. And listen, I'm not saying that. Jesus said that, right? Yes, that's Jesus' words. And so let's be careful not to be a Nicodemus in 2023, thinking that because of all the stuff that we've done and, and who we are, that we're going to be with God, because we're not. That's not truth. That's lying to people. We have to be graciously born again by the love and the mercy of God. We need the Holy Spirit to come and to quicken our heart because we're dead in our sin without Jesus. We need to be made new. We need to be brought to new spiritual life. The Bible says that all of us have gone astray. No one seeks for God. No one understands. All of us have turned to our own way. All of us are sinners. All of us are born with a sinful nature. All of us cannot see the kingdom of God, cannot see what Jesus does and say, yes, you are the son of God, the savior, without God working on our heart first. We need God to work in our heart before we can be born again and saved. Nicodemus was confronted with this reality. But Nicodemus wasn't alone, ladies and gentlemen. All of the Jews of the day held to this view, for the most part. As long as I'm not really wicked, I'll be with God. Because I'm a descendant of Abraham. The problem is Jesus comes. God the Son comes and he says to us, no, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Without Christ, Paul tells us that we're dead in our sin. We're dead in our sin and our trespasses. We saw that in Ephesians 2 verse 1. And because we're dead in our sin, we are by nature children of wrath, deserving of God's punishment. That's who we are by nature. We're born sinful. We're born as a rebel. We don't want God's loving rule. We want to rule ourselves. You two ways to live, guys. You know what I'm talking about, right? We've been studying the gospel and what the gospel is. But you see, I believe that we've been mistaken today, and it's not new, 
But I think there's a prevalent idea, even within the church today, that all people are mostly good. We're just a little spiritually sick, and we need Jesus to come and clean us up a little bit. The reality is, though, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say that you're just a little sick, and you just need to reach out and grab Jesus, and he'll clean you up. The Bible doesn't say that anywhere. The Bible says that we are, without Christ, dead, spiritually, in our sin. Last time I checked, dead people do not give birth or wait, do not come to life, right? Without God, without God. And so you and I need to be born again because without being made new spiritually, you and I would never see the kingdom of God like Jesus said. Without being made new, uh, without being born again, we would never come to repentance of our sin and faith in Jesus. And without being made new, we'd never then experience the gracious gift of eternal life. So number two, in order to see the kingdom of God, we must be born again. It's a requirement for entry. It's a requirement to experience that life which God gives to those who believe in Jesus Christ. Now it's clear Nicodemus has no clue about what he is talking about because he says this, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Now, we give him a bad rap here. You know, we kind of pick on Nicodemus. Come on, Nicodemus, really? Maybe he wasn't being that ignorant by saying this, but we know one thing's for sure. He doesn't know what Jesus is talking about, but he should have. And in verse 10, when we get to it next week, Jesus calls him a teacher of Israel. He should have known the Old Testament and known what Jesus was talking about. So Nicodemus, a teacher of Israel, doesn't understand Jesus. So Jesus again says this to him. The same thing, but a different way. He says, truly, truly, in verse 5, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, or and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So now, being born again also means born of the water and spirit. We're going to break that down in just a moment. For without being born of water and the spirit, we cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So what does it mean? Water. Well, many suggestions have been made about water. Some say, well, that's speaking of Christian baptism. That's unlikely because Christian baptism did not exist at this point in time. Nicodemus would have had no clue what that, mean, what that meant. Uh, some people believe this means physical birth, the amniotic fluid, The water, when it bursts, you know, you're born. Likely not so. The most plausible answer to this, what does he mean by born of water? We find in Ezekiel 36, uh, verses 24 to 25. And in Ezekiel 36, we find the prophecy given by God, this promise given by God of what he's going to do in his people. He says in verse 24 of chapter 36 of Ezekiel I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries. So he's going to return them from exile and bring you into your own land. And then God said, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanlinesses and from all your idols. I will cleanse you. And so there by that imagery, that informs what Jesus is talking about here. And Nicodemus should have known this. He should have known the the promise God gave of the, the, the cleansing that God would bring to his people. This spiritual cleansing here. And so this informs us about what it means to be born again. Born again people are washed clean. They're washed clean of their, not their dirt, but their sin. And so what does it mean? Letter A, first of all, it means that we're cleansed from our sin. That we're cleansed from our sin when we are born again. Again, the Holy Spirit washes us and cleanses us spiritually. But it also includes um, the Spirit, the second part, born of the Spirit. Ezekiel also informs us of this in verses 26 and 27, right after what we just read. He says, God says, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. So this is something God's going to do. He's going to give his people a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you 
and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. And so God says, not only am I going to cleanse you, but I'm going to give you a heart transplant. I'm going to take that stony heart that doesn't want to walk in my commands, that doesn't want to love me. I'm going to take that out and put a new one in that wants to love me, that desires now to walk in my way. Are you, you getting what the imagery here is showing? This is what was promised. Nicodemus knew this, but he wasn't connecting the dots, right? And so being born again or experiencing regeneration is this act where God in his grace cleanses us and makes us new spiritually. And this gracious work of the Spirit is closely tied, in fact, you really can't tell it apart, from the moment that we are saved. When we're regenerated, we're saved. You really can't disconnect it, and it's hard to. It's closely tied. When the Holy Spirit does this work in our life, we come to that moment of hearing the gospel, being convicted of our need for a Savior, of repenting of our sin, and trusting in Christ by faith to save us. Paul alluded to this in Titus 3.5, in case you're thinking, well, this, is, this just doesn't make sense. Paul actually says this very same thing in Titus 3.5. He says, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, so we're not saved by what we do, but according to his own mercy, so it's God that saves us, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. And so in our salvation, we are washed, we are renewed. We're given a heart transplant. We're a new creation. Do you remember that when we studied Ephesians? We're not the same man or same woman that we were before Christ. When we're regenerated, when we're born again, and when we are saved, when we've trusted in Christ. We're not the same. Does that mean we're perfect now? No, we still struggle in fallen flesh. We still battle with the world and the temptation of the devil and the world. But we have a new heart. We have a new heart. Does this kind of, kind of remind us of the reality that we're not just a little sick and we just need Jesus to kind of cure us up a little bit or reform us a little bit? No, we need to be totally redone and made new. Totally. Because we're dead. But in Christ, because he rose again from the dead, because he died for our sin and defeated death and hell and the grave, we can be resurrected to new life in him. Peter tells us this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, again, the weight is on God doing all this. We're passive. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. How? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So through that power, that resurrection power and resurrection hope, we are brought from being dead in sin to being made new in Christ. Verse 6, he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. You know, our physical birth, what does it allow us to do? It gives birth to physical life. When you're born of your mother, you enter into the physical realm, though you are born with a sinful, fallen nature. But those who are born of the Spirit, those who are born again, those who are made new, are born or can now enter into the realm of the Spirit and partake of it. You can enter into and see and experience the kingdom of God and partake of it because of the work that the Spirit has done in your life if you've been born again. Now, many of us are probably thinking, yeah, but I just, I don't know. That just seems wow, right? Well, he, he was marveling because he says, do not marvel that I said to you. Don't be wowed by this, right? He should have known all this. He's a teacher of Israel. He should have known the scripture that God said he would do this, actually. This isn't a new thing. It's something he said what he would do all along. You must be born again. Don't marvel at that. You see, here is a man by all outward appearances had his passport stamped and ready, the kingdom of God was waiting. But yet, he wasn't ready at all. 
He needed to be transformed. He needed to be made new. He needed to be born again by the work of the Holy Spirit in his life, in his heart. Then Jesus gives us this. Verse 8. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. You see, Jesus uses an illustration from nature like he does in many times to teach a spiritual truth. He says, you know, you can hear the sound of the wind, but it blows where it wishes. You can't control the wind. You can't control the Holy Spirit. You can't summon the Holy Spirit. You can't manipulate the Holy Spirit. He moves where he wills and how he wills. The Holy Spirit is not your genie in a bottle. The wind blows where it wishes. You can hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from. You can't see the wind per se, but you can see the effects of the wind, can't you? Oh, when that hurricane came last year, you could see it. The limbs falling, the trees blowing and swaying, the leaves being picked up. You can see what the wind does. You can hear it, but you cannot see it. Jesus says the same is with everyone who's born of the Spirit. You don't know when the Spirit's working on someone's life. Can't control them. But you can see the effects. You can see the evidences. You can see the fruit of a heart that's been born again. We're going to look at those here in just a moment. This mysterious work of the Spirit is just that. It is mysterious. We, we again, cannot manipulate, control, or summon Him. It's all a sovereign act of grace, which makes us marvel even more. We just sang, sang Amazing Grace This should cause you to stop and say, wow, if you've been born again, you should marvel, not at this teaching, but that God, in his kindness, caused you to be born again to a living hope. That should cause you to rejoice as a believer. No matter where you find yourself in this life as a Christian, you should look back to that moment and say, wow, God, you you took a dead man, you took a dead woman, and you made him alive. You made her alive by your grace. In John 1, verses 12 and 13, we saw that those who believe or receive Christ do so by the will of God. He says, but to all who did receive him, Christ, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born, listen to what John says, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so when we believe and receive in Jesus, when we're saved and when we become a child of God by the grace of God, it's not because we've decided to by our own will. It's not because of our bloodline. It's not because of anything that anyone has done other than God did a work in us. And so number four, the work of the Spirit is a sovereign act of grace. It's a sovereign act of grace, and it should cause us to just burst forth in praise and Singing Amazing Grace. Wow. You saved a wretch like me. I once was blind. Blind people just don't start seeing. But when Jesus comes and makes them see, they can. Lost people can't find themselves. That's pr- I'm pretty sure that's why we call them lost. Right? Now, sometimes you can be lost on a trail and end up coming out where you thought, right? But no, when you're lost spiritually, you can't find your way out. But God can leave the 99 and come find you. And he does. So number five, how do we know that someone is born again? Bear with me because I just want to give you some, some fruit or evidences to test your life. Have I been born again? Because that's the only way I can become a child of God and be saved and enter into the kingdom of God. And we're going to look to 1 John, one of his letters, for uh, these evidences and these fruits. But I say this with caution. These are evidences of someone who has been born of God. The Bible's going to tell us that. But we cannot know with absolute certainty. Only God knows with absolute certainty who is born again. 
So we got to be careful with that. But these are evidences. Jesus said, you know a tree by its fruit. You're going to know who's a believer by the fruit. It may not be a lot of good fruit at first. The tree may have to grow a little bit. There may be some bad fruit every now and then. But majority of it, over time, there will be good fruit as an evidence. And this is the good fruit that you'll see in someone who is born again by the Spirit. Verse uh, 29 of John 2, 1 John 2. He says, now little children, I'm going to start in 28. Now little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink back from him in shame at his coming. So we don't have to be ashamed when Jesus comes. We don't have to be shrinking back, but we can have confidence as a believer. He says, if you know that he is righteous, so if, if Jesus is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. And so if you're born again, you will have this habit in your life of not living for the lust of the flesh like you used to. You're still going to sin, sorry to say. You don't have your glorified body yet. But your heart is different now, and so you will practice righteousness more and more than you did before. 1 John 3, 9 and 10, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. That means no one born of God will have a habitual way of life that's marked by sin. There's going to be conviction. As a believer, when you're sinning, you're going to experience the conviction of the Holy Spirit. If you don't, that's a problem, right? <laughs> if you just say, now nah, I'm going to do this. I don't care what the Word of God says. I don't care what God wants for my life. There's no conviction. That, that, there might be a problem there. Either you're very immature as a believer or you've never become a believer. It says, For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are children of God and who are children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Oh, so there he adds love for our fellow uh, believer. And so um, those that are born of God, who have the Holy Spirit within them, and the Holy Spirit's done this work, you will not excuse sin. You will, you will commit sin, and you will need to confess sin, but you will not excuse your sin. Your life will not be marked by an hab a habitual practice of sin. Uh, we will be um, empowered by the Holy Spirit to walk in the way that he calls us to. Not perfectly. The fruit's not always perfect, but it will be there. And so letter A, they'll grow in holiness. A born-again person will grow in holiness. 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. So if, if you've been born of God, you will love. You will love with a Christ-like love, not just a generic love. An atheist can love, can show love. But we're talking about a Christ-like love. And this is possible because, again, the Holy Spirit was within you, empowering you to love like God. And so another evidence is that they will grow in love. More and more, they will love like Jesus. 1 John 5, 1 says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And so a person who's born again will demonstrate a continuing belief in Jesus. That's what it means there. Not just that they acknowledge and say, Oh yeah, I believe. But that their belief will show itself as they continually trust in Jesus. That's what that word means there in the original language, to continue in faith, to continue in their trust of Jesus, because he is the Messiah. He is the sent one of God. He is God the Son who died in our place for our sin and rose again from the dead. And so another mark is that they will confess faith in Christ. They will confess a continuing faith in Christ. And lastly, one that all of us probably are familiar with. This is a fruit or evidence that we find in Galatians. Paul says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, 
or faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. So how do we know that someone is born again? Well, we can't say with absolute 100% certainty. But the scripture does clearly show us, doesn't it? That these are evidences. These are fruits that we can hold up to our own life. The scripture can serve as a mirror to our own life. And are we truly born again? Have we truly surrendered our life to the Lord Jesus Christ? Have we repented of our sin, that is, changed our mind about our sin and turned from it and turned toward Jesus alone to save us? Have we placed our faith in Him? Jesus knows our heart. He knows where we stand before Him. And so where do you stand before Him? If He were to ask you, or stand before you like Nicodemus and say, unless one is born again, he cannot see or enter the kingdom of God. How would you be able to respond? Where's your life? Where's your heart right now? In response, not to me, but to the God of the universe, Jesus Christ. What's your response to him? The word of God gives us this hope. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Those who are born again will believe in Jesus Christ. They will not perish forever in their sin, but they will have eternal life. But here's the reality, and I'm taking this from a commentator I read. Didn't come up with it, but I think it's something we need to be left with. Being born again is essential to entering into the kingdom of God. But listen, there's going to be a day when those who are not born again will wish that they were never born to begin with. Where are you today? Let us pray. Father God, we're grateful for, for, the, for the forthrightness that your word sometimes brings to us, uh, that it does serve as a mirror and a chisel and a hammer toward our heart and our life. And God, we pray today that you would uh, do what you have set out to do in your word. I pray that those who have been born again are encouraged, but also challenged to consider where they are and in their walk and their maturity with Christ. If there is sin, I pray that they be led to confess it before you. God, if there be someone here today that maybe your spirit's been at work in their heart as even this message has been shared, as your word has been declared. Oh God, I pray that by your Holy Spirit and its power, his power, God, that you would have mercy and cause them to be born again. And so if that's you here today and you know that you've not been born again, but the spirit of God is working in your life, repent of your sin. And believe and receive the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's the only hope for your soul and the souls of all of us. God, we pray all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Well, hey, we're going to end by sharing with you a new song. It's a song you might have heard on the radio, but you'll know it pretty easily because it's scripture. It's John 3.16.